um, at the 33rd Virginia Film Festival uh, in this screening of Test Pattern by director Shatara Michelle Ford. Uh, we're so lucky to be joined by her uh, and also actors Gail Bean and Amani Starnes. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, so I want to start uh, with a question for Shatara, um, which is like, I'm just really interested in knowing about like how you got this film made um, because its subject matter and themes run so contrary to, you know, to what we usually see, even in indie films. Um, so can you just, you know, enlighten us about that a little bit? Yeah, um, goodness, I, you know, I had, I've been reading a lot about um, rape kits over the end of 2016 through to 2017, just story after story after story of just them not being, uh, you know, tested properly and dealt with and that there's a backlog and um, I think that was the first time I'd ever really understood what, you know, a rape kit was. And I just kind of dived in wanting to know everything. And I started running into a whole bunch of other stories about folks who just couldn't get them, whether it be they were being charged extortion amounts of money, which is illegal to charge any money for a rape kit, um, or hospitals didn't know what they were or didn't have the right people to administer them and um, do the forensic support that they needed. Um, or there was even a bigger hurdle before then, which is um, having a person be able to sit with themselves, um, take the time to reflect on their experience, um, deny the social conditioning that's been put in front of them, deny the victim blaming that happens so often, and accept that this is, and like own that this is something that has happened to them and that they should um, maybe even get one. And that time frame is really, really short, as in for a rape kit to work, it's really short. And it's incongruent with the way in which human beings, especially oppressed human beings, um, process assault and rape. So I was really interested in that moment on top of all of the other systemic issues that keep a person from being able to get the things that they need, um, which is healthcare, justice, closure, clarity, all of those things. And so, I don't know, I've read so many stories and it culminated up into about, um, you know, November 2017, and I just regurgitated a script. Um, it was a 35 page script, which to a lot of people doesn't make sense if you understand how a script is a page a minute. Uh, but for me, there's so much, you know, especially in the experience of just kind of like processing things and internalizing things and wanting to have a larger conversation about um, systems it didn't make sense for me to be really like long-winded and prescriptive. I knew there was a point A and a point B in every single scene. And I knew there was a point A and a point B from the beginning to the end of the script. And so I looked at those kind of spaces as opportunities for actors to kind of build out characters together, to expand on like, what is that middle part that I haven't written? Um, and yeah, however, when you're writing a 35 page script and then you try to move it around town, that doesn't make sense to anybody because I think we understand Hollywood to be a very, uh, I don't know, a straightforward, unimaginative uh, uh, industry for the most part. Um, and then it's coming from, you know, a short black person, femme, woman who they've never seen before, heard of, or before, doesn't even care about, doesn't have a special agent, none of that. So there's just no way that that script was going to get anywhere or do anything. Um, the next thing is that I, you know, wanted this to be about a Black woman. Um, and I wanted it to be about a Black woman in her early 30s. And there are very few Black women in their early 30s, especially back in 2017, in Hollywood that counts as something 
meaningful that will bring you financing that is worth kind of pushing forward. I already knew that was going to be a thing, so I didn't want to engage with it. I knew that I, this was also a role that was really important to give to a Black woman um, and give her the opportunity to just know, let show what she has always had that no one's ever given her the opportunity to do. So I was really looking forward to finding someone new um, in that respect too. So again, that doesn't get you money, that doesn't get a movie made. Um, so immediately I kind of always knew that I was going to be making this myself. Um, my producer Pinch and Lou and I were in the middle of doing or prepping for a proof of concept short film that was going to take a lot of kind of like sci like technical underwater work um, into it. And we had raised $100,000 to do that. Um, when I gave Pynchon the script, she kind of looked at me and she was like, I, I think we need to do this instead um, right now. And we should take this money that we were going to use to prep this other thing and just make a movie. Um, we recognized that, you know, this wasn't going to be enough money to make the movie that we wanted to make. And so we started thinking strategically about other things like, um, you know, locations. Um, we knew that Austin was a filmmaker friendly city. I'd already, you know, said it there intentionally knowing that. Um, we also knew that we had a lot of good friends and collaborators who would do this. Um, they would still be paid, but we might not have to pay them the you know extreme amounts that they all deserve that we absolutely couldn't afford um and i took out oh my god at the start nine credit cards um my partner and i drained our our savings we we're gonna buy a house we decided not to um and we put it into the movie and um we also took out two loans um, I have amazing credit, by the way, because I've been supporting myself since I was 18 years old. So student loans has given me like, like lives, has me living in the 800s. So I just decided to like, just tank my, my credit effectively. So I just kept taking out credit cards. Um, and uh, that's how we paid for the movie um, because there were really important things that we knew that needed to happen. We knew that the, the film needed to have nuance and subtlety, which again, traditional Hollywood does not do, especially for a movie like this. So when I did talk to folks about it who were open to trying to make a 35 page script um, feature, they wanted me to be a lot more like, clear about what happened. They wanted to know immediately from the jump, this is rape and this is a bad guy. They wanted to know immediately, you know, she is going to get justice, the cops are going to do something, or she's going to get revenge herself. They weren't very okay with like sitting with the uncomfortable realities of what this is. And also, a lot of times, the larger conversation that I was having about how America as a system, the structures within it, and the white supremacist folks who live within it. And I don't, I don't mean that in capital W, capital S, I mean just in the idea that white people are centering themselves constantly. And that is the nature of like what our country is. And so at all fronts, we fail black women events all the time. And this experience is a really good case study for how that happens on many different levels. Again, most executives weren't really, that kind of went right over their heads, especially in 2017. So that was something that I just wasn't interested in kind of convincing people to you know, understand, nor was I interested in changing that to make them feel more comfortable. So yes, took out a lot of loans, a lot of credit cards, a lot of debt, so much debt, still in debt my life is dead. It's okay. I'm totally fine with it. But that is a fact. And that's how this movie got made. Um, and it got made where we paid everyone. It got made where everyone had a place to sleep and food to eat. It got, uh, it got made in a way that for me as a first time director, um, I had the rare experience of shooting for 21 days. Um, which I mean, you know, most indie first time directors will tell you like they make movies in 13 days, 15 days, something like that, that anything beyond that is really unheard of. And I knew that was really important to do, um, if, again, as a black woman to even have a chance 
um, at being taken seriously. I was going to have to give myself the space to do it correctly. Um, yeah, you know, our crew were paid. Everyone was looked after. Um, but yeah, that's a mouthful, but that's how it happened. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for betting on yourself. Thank you to your partner for, you know, for, for believing, uh, in this story and, and fighting to tell it. Um, <clears throat> you know, my question for, for Gail and Amani is, um, so you have this 35 page script that's, um, that you know is going to be a feature. Um, you know, as actors, um, what's the process like for you sort of filling in, you know, those, um, emotional gaps, you know, the gaps, you know, where, okay, so you've got 35 pages, but you know, you're going to have um, this full length project um, and sort of, you know, how do you, how do you bring those characters, those emotions, those dynamics um, to life? Cause I would imagine, you know, there's, there's certainly a great deal of, of responsibility for you um, in, in making this thing happen um, because so much of it uh, feels so internal and is, you know, and relies upon um, the viewer to, to understand and, and empathize um, with these like complex emotions that are taking place in the film. One thing um, I really loved about Shatara is she's very clear with us as actors on who our character is. So even though it was only 35 pages, she we we met several times before filming. We had phone conversations, um, emails, just being clear on who the characters were and the storyline. So we were granted that room to play and we also were able to bring our own creativity to each character, which I felt um, that bridge the gap on a lot of things because it was a beautiful script. Even from reading the script, you would have never known that it was going to be longer than 35 pages. You wouldn't have known. But she allowed us the time to display the character and actually watch the character unfold instead of feeling rushed at any moment to like have to get to an end point or have to get to what's exactly on the page. She allowed us time to which I felt she played with beautifully from the colors to the songs, to the shots, to the angles, um, to really highlight the character and some of the character, some things that were going on internally with the characters. And I feel that happens when you only truly know the character and you you have a clear background of not just the story that's taking place, but some of the preface, some of the story that happened before that, some of this character's life and where the character came from, what the character has gone through, understanding the dynamic and the relationship of how the characters connect to each other and how they all play a part in one another's lives. Um, so I feel that really gave us the, equipped us with the skill set and the mindset to feel and the, the creative talent to feel the the extra minutes of the storyline um but she's really good with that she's really good with like i said before she's a actor's director so it's a collaborative effort from both her and us as actors to be able to bring this story to full circle and she's there to kind of definitely guide us and direct us in the right direction of okay that's great let's let because she's on the outside looking in so it's like let's do this and do that and it elevates the character and even the storyline to a whole nother level that we as the actor might have not saw. Um, I've, I've been waiting for Shatara to make a feature movie for, for a while so I just like jumped on it when she was like oh make it a movie um, but I think similarly like as Shatara has demonstrated she's not really like a cog in this sort of machine um, that demands this kind of like, go, go, go. Um, some very famous directors are kind of like, what well, I need is speed. I just need you to say your line, I need you to be fast, and then we need to move on. Um, which, you know, works for some people. Uh, but it's like Gail, you know, Shatar and I talked. Um, I personally, like, 
don't like being unprepared for things because it really stresses me out. Um, so I was lucky enough to, to be in grad school at the time. And so there was um, like a wealth of information on um, safe nurses and forensic nurses. Um, so like I got really jazzed about doing some sort of dramaturgical research and and just really like wanting to honor my friend's project and wanting to honor all of the, the women who my character would hypothetically be helping. Um, and also just figuring out ways to sort of like put myself in everybody's shoes, which is sort of like an exercise in radical empathy. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was fun to be on set. Um, I was saying to someone earlier that Shatara kind of like creates this almost, um, it felt more like being in a play than being in a film because uh, everyone was kind of like on board and it was the most ensemble feeling I've gotten in a while. Uh, and we shot my scene at like three in the morning and everyone was delirious. And it was just like this roller coaster of emotions because <laughs> we were all really, like sad about the circumstances, but then we had to like really keep each other going because um, people were exhausted. Um, and I think that that does something too. like your brain, you're like in lizard brain mode and you can't regulate your feelings as well. And, and things just flow a little differently um, and maybe even a little bit more naturally because you can't think about it that much. Um, so yeah, I don't, it was, it was a magical combination of uh, circumstances and people. <laughs> well, also just add is that um, Gail and Amani are both actors that I adore and I've been trying to work with for a really long time. I tried to make a movie with Gail like two years before Test Pattern and it just, I could never get it off the ground. And so when I wrote Test Pattern, the roles that they have, I wrote specifically for them. So it wasn't even like, a, oh, let me just find somebody that kind of like fill this stuff. It was like, okay, I'm putting Gail in this movie. I'm putting Imani in this movie, okay. And they're gonna have to say yes. I don't know what I'll do if they don't, but like. <laughs> no, that's see, that's wonderful. what I was going to say. I was gonna say, I feel like everybody on board was rooting for Shatara because we already knew how talented she was, how great her scripts are, how amazing and beautiful her mind is. So I do think everybody on board was like, we're doing this and we're excited and happy that she's making a project that she's like, you know what, forget it, I'm doing it. If I, nobody wants to back it right now, it'll come. The universe will bring it, but we're just gonna go ahead and go all in. And like she said, we've, I've read other scripts of hers, so I already knew how amazing and talented she was. And I was just happy to come on board and bring something to her script, be involved with her. And I think everybody had that same feeling it felt like it was just everybody was happy to be there and support. And we knew Shatara's going to go on the, let me tell you, this, this, this is just the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I believe it. I, I like fully. Um, Amani, like you, you know, Nurse Peg, I think feels like such a just, Actually, everyone in this film feels important. Um, I think for you specifically, uh, and this character, you know, she's really, after, um, after Venetia's gone through this traumatic experience of waking up and realizing what's happened to her, <clears throat> um, you know, and then sort of being like dragged across town from like institution to institution, um, you know, when she finally gets to the point that there's someone who is listening to her, you know, and taking her seriously, um, and, and is, um, considerate about, like, what her specific needs are in that moment, um, you know, is, is so important, you know, at that point in the film, um, you know, you are, you are basically, you know, you are kind of providing this this psychological lifeline uh, for her in a lot of ways. Um, and I know you said, you know, you like to be prepared and you like to, you do your dramaturgical research. Um, what went into uh, informing, you know, how Nurse Peg would behave, the way she would talk to Venetia, you know, how she would, 
you know, ask her for the specific things that she needed? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, aside from Googling things, um, I took some time to, to interview uh, this woman at Stanford who is sort of like in charge of training um, safe nurses. So she gave me a bunch of literature, you know, and we just had like what I expected to be a 30 minute conversation turned into, you know, like an hour and a half of just not like the technical information of how you're supposed to prepare a kid as though, because you're sort of like an agent of the law, <clears throat> really. So there's these procedures that you have to follow. Um, but also, you know, once someone starts telling you the statistics of the amount of rape kits that aren't tested or whose rape kits get tested <clears throat> and whose get sort of forgotten, I ha you can't help but have a really long conversation. Um, and it can't help but feel personal. You know, one in four women is sexually assaulted in their life, um, if not more. Um, so it's, it, and also I think from a less sort of heady perspective, um, I just really had to, to think about my own experience of um, not being listened to, you know? Um, it's a really big problem in our, in our, in our country and in the world, really. And um, not being, I, I was telling some friends earlier, like, whenever I go to the doctor, I tell them my education level, I tell them um, who my father is, he's a big shot surgeon, you know, it's like, I need you to know that I know what's going on with my body. So don't sit there and tell me that I'm not right. Um, and it happens not just in the hospital, it happens in school, you know? Like, I remember the first time I had a black teacher, I was like, oh my God, um, my opinion is not a fight, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, I think as a little kid, it always kind of felt like I have to prove something or I have to, to make my case. Um, and so there's so many times in my life where I wish I'd had sort of like a mentor who like looked like me or like someone who just gets it. Um, and so when I was on set, like I, I mean, Brittany is also like so lovely and so easy to care for. Um, and she was doing a, a, an excellent job. So, um, it wasn't hard when I got there, but I do feel like the work that was done was like, like you said, Sarai, like psych there's that psychological element where it also just like black women sometimes don't take the time to check in with themselves because um, they're too busy checking in with everybody else. Um, and, and it was a really great space to just check in with everybody. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, so I was lucky enough um, to see this film um, at the Black Star Festival, um, which obviously was happening in the wake of Me Too. Um, but now, you know, with, with this year, with the Virginia Film Festival, we have had this summer of, um, of this reckoning on race. And, you know, the women in this movie very much sit at the center of this intersection of gender and race. Um, you know, when I think about sort of the ways that Black women are particularly failed by the criminal justice system, um, you know, whether we're thinking about, you know, the officer in Oklahoma, Daniel Holtzclaw, you know, who's basically sort of using his power um, to sexually assault women, or, you know, whether we think about someone like Breonna Taylor, who is killed in her own home, um, and then, uh, you know, the, the possibility of, of any sort of justice um, for her death feels like you know, almost like a figment of our imagination in a lot of ways. Um, you know, what do you sort of hope that this this film can deliver, like within those those two contexts? Um, you know, because we've had, I think there is, you know, sort of a, a canon or a library um, of of art that that looks at the way that white women experience rape. I think, you know, when I wrote about test pattern for film comment, you know, I invoked um, Thelma and Louise, you know, but I also think, you know, recently um, about Unbelievable, 
but you know, again, there is, you know, and Amani, you kind of touched on this, this, um, this need for there, you know, to be someone who understands how both race and gender um, affect Black uh, survivors of sexual assault. Um, so for you guys, you know, in this, in this environment that we are in right now, um, you know, has that how does that influence, you know, the way you think about and hope that this film speaks to its audience? That's a, that's a big one. Um, I mean, obviously, three years ago, or whatever, when I wrote this, I was thinking about that intersection, right? Um, and I always felt like this film as realist as it is, is also a tragedy. Um, and I think that, um, you know, anytime uh, a black woman, a black femme's uh, bodily autonomy is violated, um, it, it feels like a tragedy because things don't work like they're supposed to. And, you know, again, like I said, when I wrote this three years ago, I don't think many people actually understood that concept, that for us, things don't work like they're supposed to. Already for survivors, things don't work. But then there's this extra like expectation. So that's why I add the supposed to, because I think that, um, I think in general, black women don't, don't expect much. But I do think that there's something deep down, obviously, that that allows us to still still hope. And then when we go through the process and we have that experience of being doubted, um, being gaslit, being talked over, um, it's just more and more pain that's inflicted upon us um, to the point where we don't really know how to feel or how to think. Um, and that stuff gets shut down and muted um yeah i i don't know sorry that's a bit of a tangent i guess what i mean by that is that experience in itself i think is truly not understood and i think there's very little value in it in our society and i think that what's happened right now is that that experience whether it be you know at the intersections of you know assault rape justice um, or just, you know, invasion of privacy, um, violence of any kind, um, unnecessary trauma, death, all of these things. No, no longer can anyone in maybe America, but definitely everywhere else too, like no one can, no one can doubt that that's a thing. Sorry, that that's a thing. You know, and I do think that, you know, when I wrote it three years ago, um, I had doubters. Um, I've been on the festival circuit for a year. I have had doubters in, in my Q&As who just say this couldn't, it doesn't happen like this. It doesn't work like that. Where I'm from, that wouldn't happen. This seems extreme. Um, and I've also had the weird experience since June of getting text messages and emails from folks who'd seen the film that said, I didn't understand it the first time I saw it. I didn't really get what was happening to her, but I think I get it now. And that's a really weird piece of information to receive. It's like really heartbreaking. And, and like, you know, I, it's, it wasn't a thing that I would write back and be like, oh my gosh, great, thank you so much. It made me angry. Cause I'm like, how did you not see it? How do you not see me? How do you not see them? Um, so yeah, it's a weird time. I don't think that this film uh, is, I think it's just now because of the unfortunate circumstances that we're in, that people are kind of seeing it for what it is and it's sitting with them. And so maybe it's just doing that slow chipping away of like, their initial understandings of the world. But I, I, don't, I don't 
find that like this is going to do any kind of great revolutionary change uh one because i think there needs to be many things that happen for that to to go on but at the very least if i can just kind of let a few people sit uncomfortably with facts that have always been there and that they cannot deny anymore i'm cool with that um i just to add because i <clears throat> something to and i talk a lot about is um law and policy uh and you know the film deals with Renisha's relationship with the police um and I think it's so interesting in this film the the relationship between health and the law and black women and um the moment we're in right now um black women weren't even considered rapeable until the mid 40s when Recy Taylor finally got justice for being horribly sexually assaulted um and I still think there are vestiges of that like the idea that Black women can't be victims because they're property or they're this or they're that or they don't have feelings or what, I don't know, but it exists. Um, and I think <clears throat> when I look back, I mean, it also depends on who you're talking to, right? Like when I talk to a white guy about this film, we have a very different conversation. When I talk to black men about this film, we have a very different conversation because it's, it's interrogating their subject position and, and how they view the world and how, and it's gonna be different. Um, but when I think about myself and how I view it now, and I, I think of Breonna Taylor and how justice was not served, um, and the doubting and the, the very real, not just like floating around in the zeitgeist, oh, we don't believe black women, like the very real legal machinations at work to suppress justice. It's, 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 it's like, again, like Shara, I get very, very angry. Um, and I, I wish a film could like force people to make those connections. I don't know if it can, but we are in a different moment. So maybe people will start asking like the baby questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I can say is, like how Shatara said, this film was three years ago. Um, and since then, so much has happened. A lot was already happening back then, but I think maybe it's it's getting more media coverage with the advancement of technology. It isn't just a thing that we know is happening in the Black community and that um, non-Black people are choosing to ignore. Now it's at a point where they can ignore it. They cannot ignore it. I feel like with Breonna Taylor, there's so many reasons why she didn't receive justice, which is unfair to her and to black women in a slap in our face all over. Um, I think a lot of things just boil down to the fact that they, people still don't see black people, especially black females as humans. And they don't, um, they don't, uh, sorry, that got to me off. They don't like, connect to us for some reason. And I feel like with this film, Shatar showed Renisha truthfully and genuinely. And there were the, the moments of where she was simply just herself and there were no words. I feel like as people watch it, they will connect and see that, okay, this black female is a human, which they should simply just already know. Like it shouldn't take a film for that, but I feel like, Projects like Test Pattern do help move the needle some. It does help people see, because people aren't taking the time to get to know Breonna Taylor. As we look at Breonna Taylor and other Black females who have not received justice and who have had to experience the cruel world, which we have ourselves, and we immediately connect. We immediately see ourselves as to where other people aren't, they're not even trying to get to know or care to get to know who this person is or who this female is. And I feel like what she did beautifully is she, from, from everything, everything was strategic, everything was specific. So as to allow folks in the audience, because the audience is very diverse from white male to all different males and black females, other females, to connect and see that this is a human person. And 
she's done nothing wrong and still this is how society in America treats her. This is how she's, she hasn't received any justice and how she's being strong and is it what justice looks like to her? What seeking some sort of um, peace of mind living in a place like this, in a place of today with all the other things that have to that delve on top of it and how life is stacked against her. And not only does she have, and she also has to deal with herself in regards to the things she's faced outside of people not treating or even having any care or justice for her body, but just what's going on in the world with Trump. And then she's dating a white man who has no idea how to care and protect her, whether it's patriarchy or just male privilege or white privilege or just not understanding. And I think it's it was a really beautiful way to at least tap into whoever watches it. One thing I feel they should at least take away is we don't protect the black female. And that's the first step of even having the discussion of how do we, what does protection of the black female look like? How does the black female want to be protected? What can we do to provide a safe haven? And just simply understanding that the black female is human, just like you and me and her, or is it even a thing of what does the black female need? Because sometimes a person can have all of the right intentions for themselves, but that's not what someone needs. That's not what will do any justice in that moment. So it's like, it, it's kind of, it goes back to the, even with Breonna Taylor, like painting black lives on matter on the streets is not what we need. How does that protect us? How does that help us in any way? Like wearing African garments and kneeling isn't, I, I see your intention, but how does that help? So with Will, I saw his, you see his intention. You see what he's trying to do. You see he's trying to make it right. He didn't even ask her what she needed. And sometimes it's so, the resolution is so simple. It first starts with a conversation. It first starts with the black woman being heard. And I feel like it's so beautiful in a film where there isn't as much dialogue where the black female is speaking loud and clear. Shatara did a beautiful way of making Renisha's voice so loud. And it's not the angry black woman. It's simply just being a black female. So I feel I that, that's... I'm sorry, it, this may not be like the film that changes the world, but it should be the film that sparks the change in the world. If people, you, I mean, we wish we're grateful for you guys and all the other film festivals and everybody that has picked it up because it, it's necessary. Yeah. There's such a, you know, and I think the, for me, like the power in this film is seeing the way, you know, Renisha allows herself to blossom and to, be happy and to, you know, trust people and exist in the world, um, you know, to, to go out on that ledge um, in spite of what, you know, anyone who sort of has their eyes open, <laughs> um, you know, by, you know, despite everything sort of around her, you know, that she still takes that chance anyway, that she decides to, to live and, and be, joyful um and so to have something so violent happen to her it really you know it it makes it that much more cutting um uh, you know and gail as you were talking um you know the only thing i could think about was was malcolm x in 1962 right he says the most disrespected person in america is the black woman the most unprotected person in america is the black woman the most neglected person in america is the black woman. Um, so this is, this is not a revelation, right? This is just sort of what we've been living in. Um, you know, and that said, I, th I just, part of me just need to get that off my chest. <laughs> but I do have a question. Um, Amani, I wanted to come back to what you said about um, 
you said the disparities in the way that that people react to this movie uh, you know whether it's white men uh, black men other men of color can you can you tell us a little bit uh, about that you know versus maybe some of the conversations you've had with with women in the audience um i'll, I'll tell you briefly i feel like shatara should also definitely jump in on this question um but you know like i remember feeling really so i had had a summer job before the screening at the black star festival and i had invited one of my like work someone who worked for me and he was this like super like abercrombie and fitch looking white dude and he was so earnest and like he wanted to see the movie and like i remember fighting this feeling in myself to like try to make him comfortable um because he like he had never seen anything like that before you know and and i wish i could have talked to him about it but afterwards he was just like i have, to, I have a lot to think about you know um and uh but i, I it's been interesting talking to men of, of both races so like uh i talked to one white guy who was basically like but you know will's character was just trying to help and i was like okay we need to have a conversation about what it means to help, right? Um, and then I talked to a black guy who, bless their heart, like didn't even really appreciate the gravity of like the sexual assault, you know? And I was like, so you don't see how men are conditioned to like think that's how it should be, right? Like he just, I think a frat culture at colleges and stuff. And it's just, it's like, no, you get drunk, you hook up, you go home. Um, and no one thinks about how problematic that is. Um, so those are just a couple of, I, of, of um, reactions that I got. And um, I mean, even I had, like, it's not like I have the magic decoder ring and I sat down and watched the film for the first time and was like, this is what it's about. And this is how I'm supposed to react. Um, but, you know, it's like uh, a lot can be gleaned from someone's, you know, first reaction to something. So Shatara had some, some great ones too. Oh, there was one more that really made me mad. Um, similar to what Shatara said, uh, we were in New Orleans and this lovely white woman from uh, Boston was like, well, we have the best healthcare in the world. Like this would never, I just don't believe it. I don't, no, mm -mm. And And this is, a problem I find when any black creator makes anything, and I mean like there's tr volumes of books written about the problem with the problem with black cinema and black theater is that it's always deemed melodramatic. And I wanna be like, life is fucking melodramatic for people. Like it's not, it's drama, like it, it's real life. So I'm sorry if you don't believe that these things are real, but then like if you don't, like why are you here? And why are you talking to me? Um, so I'll get off my soapbox. Oh. <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> Shatara. Um, well, you have to remember, like, the, the reason why, I, like, I, the movie's called Test Pattern. I did this for a reason, right? Like, I, I, I made it as, as straightforward as possible, but without... I mean, there's definitely a point of view, but without being preachy. And people really hate that. They want me to tell them so badly what to think. I'm never gonna tell you what to think. Um, and what I found really interesting, like we did, I don't know, 20 test screenings of this, maybe more. Um, Gail's been to some, I mean, there was, a, there was a test screen that Gail was at where she really got with somebody. So like, she's got stories too. Like, it's just, it's really interesting. Um, the whole, I. Look, I wanted, this is just supposed to be um, a sense check, a temperature check, right? Like whatever you get from the movie is where you're at. And that goes for all of us, um, you know? Um, the things that make you uncomfortable, the assumptions that you make um, in your first viewing, the, the people you really draw yourself to, that all is showing you a lot about how you feel about race and class and gender um, and how you understand assault 
And I think, you know, like I said, it's been three years now, right? So I've had a lot of time to kind of filter audience responses um, related to different sections. And I think the one that is most shocking across the board, um, regardless of gender, regardless of age, regardless of race, regardless of sexual orientation, is how badly versed our country is in the understandings of assault and rape. And now I, I, I separate those two, but like, as we understand, assault is a spectrum and rape is all the way at the other end of it. But people don't like that end. They don't, if it's not Harvey Weinstein extreme, they will always make an excuse. They will always find a way to justify it not as that. And the number of casual conversations, like there's so many things that people wanted to talk about or do want to talk about with this movie. But the one thing I will make really, really, really clear for this audience and for every audience is that Renisha was raped, absolutely. And that within this context, somebody wanting to go out, has a good time, was coerced into being a bit more like, I don't know, easy going with a person than maybe she would have otherwise. But like there was a, a ramping up of assault that ended in rape, but she was violated quite early on and continued to be like, you know, I've got tallies on it. Like with my editors, we'd sit and be like, yep, that's the first one. That's the second one. That's the third one. That's the fourth one. So just without any, you know, that's the thing. And I think that's what I, I struggle with the most um, is seeing that in people seeing that assumption and also the need for um justification of it right it can't just be rape it has to be well well she was drugged like it was an active choice like somebody this is an evil person that did this i'm going to tell you something else guys she wasn't she actively she chose to take drugs and she took too many but that was her choice now there's always a level of like um coercion again that allows someone to, um, like they knowingly probably knew that like, yeah, if we drink enough, yeah, if we do enough, like we'll probably be able, but it's it's not so calculated as, you know, a you know, maniacal evildoer twirling a mustache and being like, okay. But people love to sit with that because they have such a hard time thinking about the other things, because in a lot of ways, we've all been in that situation. And maybe you were the perpetrator who was doing that. You pushed this cute girl to have one more drink, because you knew. It's that kind of thing. Um, and so the responses I really love is when um, there will be, it's usually men in the audience, horrified. They say nothing. Um, but then they'll find me after and say, I think I did this. And I'll say, which thing? And they say, oh, all of it. And, you know, I'll have friends that send me emails saying it, friends sending me text messages saying it, friends sending me to call and process with me saying it. It's that thing. And that I'm also very, very, very proud of with this film. The fact that I can let a person sit with that and recognize that maybe they made certain choices or participated in a culture that led to this is huge to me. And so if that, helps further that conversation, golden. Um, regarding the other stuff, I mean, it's, I think the most notable thing, and going back to just thinking about humanizing black women, is that there was this um, white man in his late 30s from the Midwest um, who'd gone to a Big Ten school, and worked in tech and was just like very bro -y, who said at the end of the film, wow, I, I don't even mean this to be funny. I mean it seriously. I felt like I was Renisha and I've never felt like a black woman before. And that like really <laughs> sad, <laughs> like that hit me really hard. Um, and he was like, yeah, you just did so, such a good job letting me like get into her head. And I thought to myself, 
I had to do a lot of things. I had to like pull out dialogue. I had to get rid of stuff just so you could see this person. So you're telling me that on a normal day, on a given day, you don't, you can't empathize. Like you had to be put into a captive space for 90 minutes or 82 minutes to feel someone else's feelings. I don't know, that's scary, but yeah. Oof, my goodness. Well, I will say, I'm just, I'm so glad that you acquired distribution, that Kino Lorber had the sense to see what, um, what a valuable film this is. Um, and I, are, <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so I, this is gonna be my last question for real, because <clears throat> I realized I've already kept you guys like over time. Um, and that is, and I guess this is largely for Shatara, but you know, Gail and Amani, if you, you have thoughts that you wanna share, you wanna chime in, like feel free. Um, you know, I think so often, going back to what Amani was saying about like this, um, uh, the reception of, of films that are centered on or by or about black people, um, you know, being dinged as too melodramatic. Um, you know, I think there's also, and this doesn't just happen um, with films about black people. Like it's, it's usually films about issues, right? That they often get described as important. <laughs> um, and so what I wanna know is, you know, what decisions did you make to ensure that this film wasn't just important, but that it also worked as a piece of cinema, which I think it does beautifully. Um, I think that um, just as a filmmaker, I made the choice to be very honest about my point of view and lived experience. And I think that I think that there's something that happens to Black creatives, I can only speak in, for Hollywood, where we have ideas about things that we want to make. And we tell the overwhelmingly, oppressively white decision makers that this is what we want to make. And they'll either say yes or no, depending on if they understand what you're talking about. And there's some weird experience. I don't get why it happens, but these white gatekeepers think that they know everything and they think they know everything about my life and my experience and ours. I don't understand where that comes from. I really do not, but they do. And so what you'll hear is that, oh, this didn't connect with me. And I don't know what that means because that's such a stupid phrase. Uh, that doesn't connect with me. It's, why? Because you haven't lived it, so therefore you don't know. Because you don't have the ability to empathize, because you're not sure if other people will approve, because you don't know where it sits. And so I think that um, I made a choice very early on to not write things or select projects to present to white gatekeepers um, that I know they'll connect to. Um, because there's so much that needs to be explored that has absolutely nothing to do with them. And they'll either, so the question isn't, do you connect with it or not? It's do you trust me or not to do it? So purely by doing, purely by investing in things that white people don't connect to, anything I make will be seen as important because they're learning something. So knowing that, already knowing that whatever I do is gonna be deemed as that, um, I just try to make art. And I love cinema, I love it. And I had, a, this film is much more of a conversation that I'm having with, you know, either, you know, Malik or um, Darren Aronofsky, because I saw Mother and I was like, God, he's doing a lot to just explain how life is shitty for women. I'm just, I don't even need to do all that. Like, that's literally what was the impetus for me even writing it. It was like, how do I write a horror film that's, you know, so frightening without having to do all that? So, um, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I was in conversation with Aronofsky and in conversation with Hitchcock. Um, but I, what I wasn't doing was trying to tell an important story. 
So I just want to speak on um, just Shatara as a director. I feel her film test pattern was both cinematic and very important to us because she, like she said, she was honest. And I feel she was very clear with her vision as she communicated that. And like she said, some filmmakers do not do that because they're afraid of the no. At the end of the day, you can commit to what you know you want and inform people very clearly and honestly, and they can either say yes or no. Shatara was not afraid of her no's. She was very clear that this is a story that she wants to make. Those who will get it are going to get it and they're going to be involved. Um, so I feel it was cinematic because she communicated it and she allowed everybody who understood it and got it to come on board and do their part and collaborate with her in telling the story. But most importantly, she stuck to her honesty and her truth. And it's, it isn't that complicated. Like she said, it's simply just telling what you've been through, what you've seen, what you've experienced, what you know, what she knows as just a black woman here in America. Um, so it was really simple and cut dry, I, I feel, um, when I read it and when I saw and spoke with her about what she wanted to do and her vision that she wanted to bring to life. And she didn't sacrifice who she was or the story for, like she said, white, gatekeeper decision makers to say, okay, you can make this. She didn't sacrifice what she already knew to be true, just to justify it. Because I feel like a lot of the honesty is what allowed people to connect and say, oh, I think I did all of this. Because then if you dramatize it and make it, make the white male monster to be someone who is unrealistic or the worst of the worst, um, then you have a lot of men who, are on that spectrum, fall somewhere between assault and rape, but they, do, they don't see themselves as that person. And they're like, whoo, watching it like, thank God that wasn't me. And no, this is you. This is about you. You have played a hand and participated and contributed to the, the emotional baggage and scarring of a black woman that we have to overcome and continue to steadily be great and still have to deal with this. So the honesty, the vision, and the communication. And uh, we, we're talkers. Um, I, I, I really was pissed um, when it took so long for this to get picked up by somebody. Um, I just think, you know when you're right. You know what I mean? Like, you just know when you're right. Um, and I knew it was right. And, um, but in a way, when Shatara told me who was picking up her film, it felt like such a relief. Um, not just because somebody somewhere had recognized what we all recognized, but the fact that, like Shatara said, this is a piece of art, you know? Um, and I think the most disheartening thing was just seeing these like titans of film industry just pass it over knowing However, it was distributed, it might be passed over because it would be streaming somewhere or someone would have to find it in a, amongst a bunch of detritus of, of like crap. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's quiet. It's sort of like the opposite of the, the stereotype of black women, you know, and it's that in and of itself is doing something. Um, and what a gift to, to be, to feel elevated, you know? Um, I think there need to be, I, mean, I, I don't know, I can't reconfigure the world, but um, we need more elevation um, and more, more good, nice things. Let me say this, I'm so sorry. I think too, and I could be wrong, but I think what's really crazy is, and on a larger spectrum, the, the rapist, the, the boyfriend, I think maybe why it might've took so long because all in all, that is America to the black woman. And I think a lot of the pain and the hurt and obstacles that the black woman endures, America wants to look at it as always oh, to the other black woman, another black woman keeping the black woman down or, or causing to her divide, it demise. It's a black man and see 
here it was holding a mirror up against America. Like this, you do this too. Like the pain, the hurt, the assault, the rape, the injustice comes from you as well, just as much as it may come from someone else, but own your shit. I think that's something that a lot of people couldn't deal with. They, they, like she said, people may come up to her in private. I think they could deal with it in private, but on a larger scale of giving test pattern a platform, they were like, wait a minute. We don't want, cause it's, it's kind of a way of like admitting like guilt. So they'll secretly message her and come up to her, but they won't in a Q and A out loud, probably say, hey, this was me as well. So I think that is another reason which, like, when you just stay true to yourself, sometimes your truth, it causes the truth of others to come out. And they're not quite ready for that. I think now with where America is, with the Breonna Taylor and everything, they're like, okay, we can, we can, own up to some of our things because there's a lot of stuff we're still getting away with. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for you know your time, for your incredible art. Um, please make more, <laughs> all of you. <laughs> um, so you know, on behalf of the Virginia Film Festival, I just want to say a big. Thank you to director Shatar Ford and to actors Gail Bean and Amani Starnes for being with us.